Good afternoon, Marsha. Hello, Zena. <laughs> It's so nice to see you. So we've been invited to have this conversation um, about your work and especially about your new upcoming book, which is very exciting. Um, but I thought that uh, for the few people that might not know you, I would just do a very quick introduction um, and say that you are the William K. Landman Junior Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs in the Department of Anthropology at the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale University. Uh, you are an anthropologist of reproduction and gender and relationships, and you actually have a very, um, very long history of research in the Middle East. In fact, you're author of six books looking at issues of infertility and childlessness and assisted reproductive technologies in the Middle East. Um, and you're also the author of 10 edited volumes, which um, really begs the question, how on earth do you find the time to do it all, Marsha? I've been um, doing it for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. And, and I think it's fair to say that for, you know, for several decades, many people perhaps um, knew you best as a scholar of the Middle East, an anthropologist of the, of, anthropologist of the Middle East. Um, but your new book that's going to be coming out in sometime in the next year is actually about egg freezing in America. So that's a little bit of a shift of direction for you. Could you just tell us a little bit about how that shift occurred in your research interests? Yeah, thank you so much for the nice introduction, Zainab. Um, and it's true, I started working as an anthropologist in the Middle East in the mid 1980s. So we're talking, you know, it's been 35, going on 40 years of research. And I stayed there. I worked in Egypt and Lebanon and the United Arab Emirates. And then I shifted back to the United States and I worked with Arab refugees living in America. So I've been an anthropologist of infertility and reproductive health in the Middle Eastern region. And with that, of course, um, the concern with infertility led to sort of following the development of assisted reproductive technologies in the region. And I literally followed them, the birth of IVF in Egypt. And then I looked at the birth of intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI for male infertility. And I looked at reproductive travel of Middle Eastern people searching for a, a cure for their infertility. So that was the way my career uh, unfolded and then um, I moved here to Yale about 15 years ago and had a wonderful colleague who's unfortunately no longer here, but uh, Dr. Pasquale Patrizio uh, was the director of the Yale Fertility Center. And we were talking about research collaborations. And this was in, this was about, you know, 2011, 2012. He said, you know, the newest new reproductive technology coming down the pike is egg freezing, oocyte cryopreservation, um, the ability to freeze the human egg, which in all of the years of IVF had not yet been mastered. You could freeze human embryos, you could freeze human spermatozoa. They hadn't mastered really the freezing of human eggs successfully, but it happened that you know by the beginning of the second decade of uh, you know of this millennium, the technology was coming down the pike, and so. Um, he said, why don't we try to do a study on it? Um, and let's try to involve the Middle East. So we involved our colleague at the University of Haifa, Dr. Daphna Birenbaum Carmeli, Carmeli, who we all know. And she did a, a smaller portion of the study um, in, in Israel. I had hoped to do a piece of the study in the United Arab Emirates where egg freezing was coming along. But at any rate, it ended up just being a, a study of mostly the US, um, my portion of the study was a large study of American women who had frozen their eggs, uh, women who'd actually gone, done it, you know, had at least done one cycle of egg freezing. And so eventually um, I was asked by a very interested editor at NYU Press, uh, she'd sort of been following my career and she said, I would love to have a book on this for the American audience. Uh, and so the book is going to be called Motherhood on Ice, egg freezing and the American mating gap. And it's going to be in part of a, a, a series uh, that really looks at the anthropologies of American medicine. So it is a book that is really focusing on why American women have turned to egg freezing over the past decade, which they have in the thousands. Yeah, so between this book and your last book, we have a movement, not just from the Middle East 
to the US, but a shift in focus from men to women. Yeah, we do. And I have to say Zainab, because Zainab, I, I, I must tell all the listeners that Zainab was the incredible reader of every word of this book, because Zainab too has worked in the Middle East and Turkey on IVF and assisted reproduction, and in the UK, especially on uh, egg freezing. So you were the perfect reader for this book. And yeah, I mean, as you know, my Middle Eastern sensibilities are really part of this book as well, because I sort of tell the story of how I got to this topic myself. And, you know, one thing I can say about men in the Middle East and, and, and individuals, men and women in the Middle East, it is a very marriage-minded part of the world. More than 90% of all Middle Easterners will marry at some point in their reproductive lives. And having children, becoming parents, becoming mothers and fathers, is almost a moral imperative, whether you're Muslim or you're Christian. It's a very family-oriented part of the world where people's identities really as full human adults, really, um, you know, the expectation is that you should become a parent and people are very concerned about having children. So having worked for 30 plus years in a very child, marriage, family-oriented part of the world, you know, coming back to the United States and finding a very different scenario for women's lives here was actually kind of shocking to me. I mean, we can talk about that, but this is where the idea of the mating gap emerged for me because at the crux, the, the core issue for American women turning to egg freezing is that they're doing it because they have been unable to find that mate, that man, um, who is willing to be with them as a partner and a reproductive partner. Um, so it's really about women's frustration and anxiety over being unable to find what I term in the book, an eligible, educated, and equal partner with whom to form a family. So we have a problem here in America of what we may call missing men. Yeah. Uh, and it's very different from the scenario in the Middle East where men are very enthusiastic to partner and to mate and to have children and to marry, you know, all the things that they do to form families. That's changed a lot for America and American women. Mm. And you and you outline that sort of very succinctly and very clearly in, in the beginning of this new book where you sort of, you contrast the, the very apparent love of children that you saw everywhere in the Middle East. I think you talk about, you know, uh, fathers and men showing affection to children on plane rides or whatever, and, and kind of contrast that with the types of stories that you were hearing from these women, 150 women who were coming to you um, and mostly telling you stories of failed relationships or uncommitted relationships or, or, or missing relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, when I began the study, and I'll tell you, uh, I mean, as you know, a, a decade ago, when egg freezing came into the world, into popular discourse in the media, and, you know, just people started talking about it, because in the United States, it moved from experimental status to clinical use at the end of 2012. So it's been a decade, a decade of egg freezing in American clinical reproductive medicine. And so, you know, this new technology was out there and the media discourse then and now pretty much consistently has been, oh, this is about ambitious career women who are gonna put off their motherhood through egg freezing. They're gonna freeze their eggs so they can climb the corporate ladder. They can, you know, be a selfish, you know, single woman deciding later on to have children. And that was unfortunately exacerbated by the fact that many major Fortune 500 com companies and tech firms decided fairly early on to actually offer egg freezing as part of the overall fertility benefits that they offer to employees in their companies. And so then the discourse came, oh, companies are paying women to put off their childbearing to be, you know, better workers. And this is a terrible thing to do. It's, you know, it doesn't, it's not about reproductive rights and justice. It's exploitative, it's coercive. So I didn't know what I was going to find. Honestly, one of my hypotheses was this could be really about career building, women who are educated, trying to say, you know, spend some time working on their educations and careers. Yes, it's probably about career building. And so then I started doing these interviews, very in-depth ethnographic anthropological kind of interviews where I got a little bit of demographic data on women, but then mostly turned it over to them and said, tell me your egg freezing story. Mm -hmm. 
And so the stories that were pouring out one after another had little to do with women's careers because frankly, these women, the average age of the women in the study was 36. So these were women in the latter part of their reproductive lives who already were very educated and very well established in careers. That was not their problem. The problem was just being single and more than uh, more than 80% of the American women and I, of the women doing so-called elective egg freezing, women who were doing this electively, not because they had a medical condition. I interviewed 114 of them and 82% of them were single. And then there was another sort of 9% of women who were in relationships, but very unstable relationships. So more than 90% of these women were turning to egg freezing because of relationship troubles. Either they were single or they were in a troubled relationship. And, and a significant percentage of those women who had become signal, single had been in traumatic breakups, you know, relationship breakups, divorces, broken engagements, the ending of long-term partnerships. So it was almost a traumatized group of women. I call it relationship trauma. So you had that group of women who were coming out of long-term relationships where they has, had assumed that they would be together and have children and then finding in their late thirties, even early forties that the relationship ended and what to do. And then most women who were just single, they had been single sometimes for many years. A lot of women said, I've really only had one relationship my whole life, or I've had a handful of relationships. I haven't been with anybody for several years. And so it was relationship issues that really rose to the fore of this study. I didn't know that that was going to be the, the finding, but it was the major ethnographic finding. And then when you started asking you know, about, well, what are the troubles? What are the things that you're looking for? A whole number of issues came to the fore about why relationships are so fraught. And I ended up just calling this thing the mating gap, okay? There is a gap. It's, both, it's expectational, it's demographic in America. And it goes like this, um, you know, in America, over the past, really since the 19, since feminism, since the 1970s and 80s, um, women have been accelerating, especially in terms of education, educational matriculation. Women have, um, you know, gotten into higher education in great numbers, have pursued careers. Their mothers, if they were, you know, feminists, were telling them, go for it. You can have it all, you know, get educated, get a career and have a family. It's not impossible to do those things. And so a lot of American women who were educated have developed brilliant careers, you know, so you've got a, a group of, of millions of highly educated American women now. And their expectations are that they want to find equal men. They want to find men who are also educated and, and have careers and want to be in a, an egalitarian, loving, sharing kind of relationship with somebody who's not intimidated of them and their accomplishments, somebody who wants to be a parent with them. You know, they want an equal relationship with a like-minded person. And the trouble is they're not finding these men, you know, and these are women who've spent thousands of hours on online dating apps. It's not that they weren't trying. And a lot of women said, look, it's not like I went to medical school and didn't try to date. I've always been hoping to find a partner along the way, right? You know, but I've really had trouble finding somebody. And this story occurred over and over and over. And so why is that in America? And this is where the brilliant book of an economic journalist named um, John Berger comes to the fore. He published a book in 2015 talking about a real problem in the United States, which is the acceleration of women in higher education in America, coupled with the rapid decelera deceleration of American men in higher education. Ha men are not thriving educationally in this country. We have millions of men who may start college and never complete it, you know, start university and never complete it, or who never went beyond a high school diploma or didn't even get the high school diploma. And this has been actually really pronounced in the COVID period. There have been a lot of hand-wringing articles recently in the Wall Street Journal showing that men are not doing well educationally and COVID put a lot of pressure on young men to help their families out and, and so on. So there's a problem of men 
not being educated in equal numbers to women now. And so you have a huge surplus in the millions of educated women in their prime reproductive years between the ages of 22 and 35, who are just an oversupply compared to the dramatic undersupply of educated men in this country. And so he really spelled that out in the book and it really pertained to the discussions I was having with women because women said, you know, gosh, I mean, I want somebody who's at least college educated. I mean, in America, we call it college. In the UK, you would call it university educated. Like I can't imagine being with somebody who doesn't have an education. Um, I want somebody who's relatively equal to me. And, you know, they're hard to find. They're hard to find on, you know, dating apps. And they're especially difficult to find in large urban centers along the East Coast, where I ended up interviewing a lot of women. There are huge demographic disparities in New York City, Washington, D.C., Miami, you know, um, Charlotte, North Carolina. They've, you know, documented that there are these huge disparities where you've got many more educated women living in these cities, cities than you do heterosexual educated men. So there's a mating gap. It's a demographic mating gap going on. And it's also sort of a, an expectational gap yeah. where women want a fulfilling, really fulfilling rich relationship with somebody who really fulfills them. And they don't want to settle, and that's the term, settle for somebody who doesn't meet their expectations and needs. And they often say, look at, you know, I'm not, I don't want to just marry to marry, or I don't want to get married just to have a child. I want to be in a fulfilling equal relationship, an egalitarian relationship with somebody I love and somebody who loves me. And so given those expectations, they were having a hard time finding these men. Similarly, women talked at great length about men's lack of commitment. They feel that men, and somebody really needs to work on this as a future research project, but that American men no longer have that necessity of the parents' generation of marrying. There is no longer an expectation in America, as there is in the Middle East, that one should marry and be a father and have a family. It's no longer imperative. I mean, unless you're in a very religious community in America, the, there's an option there to just not marry and not even to partner. Mm -hmm. And so in America now, 61% of people between the ages of 18 and 35 are not even partnered, they're single. So singledom is increasing, partly because it's a choice now to remain single for a long time. And women talked a great deal about this, that men just don't have the feeling that they must commit, that they need to get married, and that they can delay for as long as they want because they don't have the so-called biological clock really ticking away for them. And so you get men who are well into their 30s, well into their 40s, even in their 50s, who've never married. Um, and they may be well-to-do men who've got money and resources. They may date women, but they never really commit to them. And there are many interesting labels put on these men. I have a table in the first chapter of my book about a woman's lexicon of the types of men. There were 10 types of men. And one of them was the Peter Pan, <laughs> the man who never grows up like Peter Pan. You know, he, he can play around, he has a lot of toys, he may date, but he never really mates, right? Yeah, uh, so, so Marsha, I mean, you're talking about some really huge sociological and demographic changes. Women's educational achievements are going up it's skyrocketing and men's educational achievements are not matching that mm -hmm. um at the same time expectations about relationships are changing um and and relationship timelines are changing as you say you know men are not necessarily expected to marry certainly not expected to marry in the same sort of time scale as generations before so these are really broad sociological demographic changes but interestingly a lot of the women you spoke to in your book felt that they were the odd one out or that they'd done something wrong, that they'd somehow missed the boat or made the wrong decisions. Yeah, I, that was one of the major issues. I called it self-blame, you know, and it was very painful for me to hear. I mean, when women were saying, you know, maybe I'm too picky or I should have married my college boyfriend or, you know, what did I do wrong in this relationship or why, why, you know, I have a lot of guy friends, but nobody ever wants to take it to the next level. So much self-doubt and actually self-blame going on. And my feeling was like, in fact, I uh, 
in, in an article that was written in the New York Times, it's like, you know, no, you're not alone. You're one of hundreds of thousands of women in the same situation. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a sociological, a demographic reality. This isn't about you as an individual, what you did wrong, you know, what you did or didn't do. So yeah, that's a huge concern, you know. And that's, I guess, one of the misconceptions that you're addressing in this book, not only the, the misconception you already mentioned about the idea that, you know, these are career people who freeze their eggs are career women, you know, seeking to um, move up the career ladder, not that there's anything at all wrong with that, but that's a misconception of what's driving a freezing, but also a misconception even in women's minds about how much of an outlier they were for right. being single or for being childless. Right. Um, and I think I want to bring in another misconception around egg freezing, which you address in your book, which is that this is something that pertains purely to white middle class women. Yeah, and that is a, a widespread belief that all assisted reproductive technologies really are used exclusively or primarily by white affluent people. And that's simply not true. I mean, there are real disparities, I'm going to say, just because of cost and problems of access. But in my study of these 114 women, American women who volunteered, I mean, I put out flyers and, you know, women could respond if they wanted to. Um, they, they're up one third, fully one third of the women who responded were, were not white. They were other, they were from what we'd call, you know, various minority groups in American society. And I'm going to say that some minority um, groups were underrepresented. And this would be um, what in America we call underrepresented minority groups, black, Latina. I had no native American women, you know, volunteer for the study. Um, I did have some Arab American and Iranian American um, women volunteer, but, but you know, yes, there was underrepresentation. But nonetheless, there were Black and Latina, and you know, Arab women in this study. Okay, and then interestingly, there were two overrepresented groups: um, women who many more uh, volunteered. And if you compare it to the demography, it was a real overrepresentation. One being Asian women, particularly South Asian women, but actually, you know, East Asian American women, Asian American women, you know, from Indian heritage backgrounds or Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Filipino. So there were a lot of Asian American women in this study, even though Asian Americans make up about 5% of the American population. And on a religious level, the religious overrepresentation was seen among Jewish American women. Um, Jews only make up about 2% of the American population. And I had a huge, you know, significant number of Jewish women overrepresented in, in the study. And so if you look at underrepresentation, I think there's just the issues of access and cost. This is an extremely costly technology. It's, you know, averages anywhere between ten dollars and $15,000 to do one single cycle of egg freezing in the United States. And I'm going to say that, you know, Black and Latina women did talk about that, that it was often difficult, you know, that they had saved just enough money to pay for this, or they had sort of resorted to credit cards, or, you know, cost was an issue. And I'd like to say more about that, I think, at the end of this, you know, just about barriers to access that are structural. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but also there were some religious issues for, for minority women who'd been raised in strong Catholic traditions or in the Southern African American churches, real issues of fertility shame, that this isn't the way you should be having a baby, this isn't the right way to do it. And they talked to me, me about those things, you know, that there's, you know, real pressures and stigma and shame that you feel when you can't marry and have children in the sort of prescribed way that you're supposed to. So those were issues that emerged in, you know, in among black and, and Latina women in the study for South, for Asian American and Jewish American women. I think the reason that there was sort of overrepresentation is simply because they are among the most highly educated people in American society. I mean, if you look at who gets educated in this country in terms of minorities, Jews and Hindus are right up there in the sort of top of the American educational spectrum, you know, and general Asian Americans in this country are highly educated and so are Jewish American people. And so women of those two groups are so highly educated. And I think the issue that really, you know, women felt 
across the board, being highly educated professional women, is that a lot of American men are simply intimidated of them. You know, men who are, don't have the same level of education just really don't know, they feel real intimidation. They feel that somehow they're, they're, they're less than these women. And so how do we overcome that? How can we get, you know, men to feel that they don't have to be as educated as their partner, that that's okay. And so those are some of the issues that I saw in the overrepresented groups, you know, um, and also out marriage that in minority groups in America, like Jewish men, there's a lot of marriage with non-Jews in America. And so, you know, that is an issue for, for some women, you know, same with Asian Americans. Do you have to marry within your own ethnic group? These are sort of perplexing questions that women had to confront. But minority issues were huge. I have a whole chapter devoted to minority issues and the feeling among a lot of the more minority women that I interviewed that they want to make it okay for women from their own groups to use egg freezing and to say, it's okay. It's something that we should be accessing if we need it. It's okay to do it. We shouldn't feel so alone so shamed, so stigmatized. And so I had some real activists, minority women in my study, who were doing a lot of work on social media and you know, trying to sort of um, reach out to other members of their particular communities. And that's partly because I think a lot of women felt quite alone when they were going through this experience, didn't they? I mean, you have this sort of really, again, a very clear phrase about these single women in the couple's world of the IVF clinic and the, the very practical difficulties that come up um, when, when they're trying to negotiate that journey essentially as you know, single women. Yeah, and so the, the, bo the book is sort of divided into two halves. In the first half, I really look at the motivations. You know, why are women turning to this expensive, mm -hmm. invasive technology, which is very difficult to do for many different reasons? And in the second half of the book, I really look at the experiences of doing it. And because you've got almost, you know, 82% of these women were single, they were not coupled. And so I have a whole chapter about sort of braving the couples oriented world of IVF, because where do you do egg freezing? You do it in an in vitro fertilization clinic, an IVF clinic. And these clinics are really set up for married couples, for partnered people. And it's really a heterosexual place too. We're talking about men and women married, you know, going to these clinics. And so if you're a woman who is single and pursuing egg freezing, you go into this world where it seems to be all couples, you know, the classes that they give you, the required orientation on how to do the hormonal injections prior to the procedure, it's all set up for couples to the point where they're saying, well, you know, and when you get to that really big shot at the end, your husband can do it, you know? And so women talked about how alienating it was to be in a world where the consent forms, the instructions, the assumptions were all about being part of a married pair. And just how, you know, women said, I used to sit there by myself and look around to see who had rings on their fingers. And so um, the clinics really need to, really need to adjust to realize that there are all kinds of people coming to IVF clinics now, single women who may be hetero, single women doing egg freezing. And I'm going to say most of the women in my study were heterosexual. You know, there were three women who were bisexual, but, but basically these women in the study were heterosexual women who wanted to be married to men and weren't. And they were going into a clinic setting, seeing the husband sitting around, going to pharmacies, special fertility pharmacies where everyone standing in line was a husband except for them, you know, really painful sort of feelings that really exacerbated their sense of being alone, feeling lonely, feeling a failure, feeling, you know, self-doubt. And so I ended up really listening to women's feelings about all of this. And, and there are many suggestions on how egg freezing in the world of IVF could be much more patient-centered, could be much more nuanced and really, you know, tweaked in various ways to really meet their needs and also to meet the needs of people who are not heterosexual. I mean, there's a growing world of LGBTQ parents. And so, you know, some women spoke about that as well. Like, come on, IVF clinics, you need to address you know, the new kinds of non-normative families that are being made. And so that was really important. And I'm going to say the really difficult, perhaps the most difficult part for single women going through this 
is having to self-inject because to do a cycle of egg freezing, just like with IVF, you do have to give yourself a large series of hormonal injections. And, you know, there is a significant group of people in the world who have fear of needles. And so women talked about having to overcome that and having to do it by oneself, learning to self-inject mm -hmm. was difficult having to find somebody to take you to the particular appointments where you're required to have accompaniment. And so who's going to do that for you. And this is actually where I found, you know, sort of one of the, we don't want to condemn all men. I have to write that through various points of my book. Not all men are contemptible louts. Okay. I benefit from my relationship with many different men in my life, my husband, my father, my brothers, my son, my uncles, you know, all of us, you know, I mean, we all probably have some man in our lives who can be helpful. And indeed women did, you know, so there were men, I wrote another chapter on just a support system that women use to get through egg freezing. And it was often family members, you know, especially moms, especially mothers and often sisters, but also fathers, fathers doing very sweet things to try to make their daughters feel better, to give their, you know, paternal consent, often offers of money, um, to daughters, um, to, or helping them with the budgeting of it. So fathers were definitely there and brothers often came through, often, you know, accompanied their sisters to the clinic. And then there were all of these men who cared. I just called them the men who cared, you know, male friends, old friends, friends from college, um, and former partners, you know, people who once were important in a partnership who still cared about their former partner and showed up, you know, really showed up for women and also new partners. I mean, there were some very unstable partnerships, you know, there were about 10% of the, there were about 18% of women who were partnered, half of them in rather unstable partnerships, but there were sort of the new partners, men who had just recently been in women's lives and showed up for them, you know, helped with the injections, brought soup after the, you know, the extraction of the eggs. It was, there were a lot of these stories that really showed that, you know, men, even though they may not show up as the reproductive partner that you want, there are men who care about women they love and they wanted to be part of this to make the procedure itself go better. So that was really important. Just, you know, women did draw on circles of support. Women nowadays are often going through egg freezing in friend groups. And so I wrote a lot about that. You know, there were certain women, I call them the egg freezing bellwethers, the ones who were the first to do it and then had a very successful outcome. And so then their friends sort of followed the path and, and often they, you know, were in these supportive networks with each other. Um, we can talk about this, but some women are, you know, freezing their eggs and then deciding to just go for single motherhood, just deciding, mm -hmm. you know, forget it. I'm probably not going to find the man that I dream of. So I'm just going to do this with donor sperm and do it on my own. And so I saw that phenomenon beginning in my study and women again, showing up for each other in that world too. Like, you know, we can get houses next to each other and we can support each other's, you know, children and be a support for each other. So all sorts of new things are emerging uh, <laughs> that you see when you study this particular reproductive technology. Yeah. So those women, um, especially the ones that kind of then became influencers for their friend groups and things like that. I mean, by and large, you found that women felt pretty happy about their experiences and their, um, their decision to freeze their eggs, didn't you? Which is in itself is an important finding. It's a hugely important finding. You know, yes, there were critiques, especially of the process of going through it in the clinic. I think my most critical chapter in this book, it's got eight sort of substantive chapters, is really about that clinic experience and the things that women wish had been different for them in the clinic. And that's really important for IVF clinicians to really take a hard look at. You know, I would say they should read that particular chapter. But, you know, I asked them to read it all. They should read it all. Right? <laughs> they should really read it all. But that chapter really, you know, is the one that pertains to the clinic. But, at, you know, at the end of the day, I said, well, you know, how do you feel about having done this? These are all women who had completed at least one cycle of egg freezing, and several of them had done more. I mean, there were a significant proportion of women who'd done two cycles, three cycles, and even four cycles of egg freezing. And they spent a lot of money and time and effort doing this. And so how did you feel about it? 
in 93% of the interviews, women had something good to say about egg freezing. And many of them gushed. I mean, there were women who had 10 positive things to say about the way it made them feel. And I ended up, as you know, coming up with a huge chart of just all the positive phrases that women use to describe their egg freezing experience in these sort of 10 different categories. Um, you could really look at different ways that egg freezing made fe women feel better. I mean, there was just a lot of psychological relief and peace of mind. There was this feeling of, I did something for myself. The thing that I could do now, I did for myself. There was a certain degree of technological optimism, like I'm living in an age where this is possible. It does allow me to extend my fertility and I hope that I'm gonna be able to use those frozen eggs. Um, there were feelings just of timing, like you know, I was coming to the end of my reproductive lifespan. I have bought myself a little bit of time here at the end, you know, where I still now have the chance of a biogenetic child and motherhood. And anyway, there were, were a plethora of things that women had to say. I mean, I think I have like 200 plus entries in that chart, sort of dividing it into sort of 10 different categories of, of positivity, if you will, things that women had to say positively about egg freezing. And that's not to say that women didn't have critiques because they did. And those are sort of scattered around the book. And I am gonna say that I think two things that really merit attention in terms of the critique I mean, a lot of women, these were women who were well-employed for the most part. I mean, really well-employed in many cases. And they said, you know, for me, it was affordable. You know, I spent $30,000 on my two or three cycles and I didn't, it, I, I, it was in my savings. I didn't have to borrow. I didn't have to ask my parents, but I have a sister who's a school teacher or I have a dear friend who, you know, is a psychotherapist and she doesn't make that much money there's no way she will ever be able to do this. And that's just not fair. Mm -hmm. And people also talked about, you know, lesser educated and minority populations in America. You know, it's just not fair that only a certain group of well-paid people have access to this technology. Something needs to be done. And they had a lot of suggestions about that. Not only that the, pro, uh, the price needs to be brought down, but that there should be various ways to finance egg freezing, different options, you know, made available to women who don't have the cash up front. And then we come to this issue of health insurance in America. You know, we do not have a national health insurance an NHS in the United States. This is a very fragmented private fee for service kind of healthcare landscape in America where, you know, you're lucky if you've got good, good health insurance. And sadly, um, Assisted reproductive technologies, everything from, you know, in vitro fertilization to egg freezing, most people do not have any kind of coverage in their health insurance. So for most people, you have to pay huge amounts of money out of pocket. Now, there are some of the sort of most secure companies, Fortune 500 companies and, you know, big tech companies in America <coughs> that um, do have fertility benefits as part of their health insurance package. And these fertility benefits in most cases were set up for married couples who could demonstrate a year minimum of infertility, that they were having at least a year of infertility, diagnosed infertility, and then the health insurance would cover some number of IVF attempts. So that's really what the basis, if you do have health insurance with fertility benefits, that was really what it was about. It was really geared toward married couples experiencing infertility. And so then, you know, the few tech firms, you know, Google, Facebook, Intel, Apple began offering egg freezing as part of the fertility benefit package. And they did that as I sort of document in my book, because women working in tech were very mad that it wasn't available to them. And, and they felt a real sense of discrimination as single women. They said, if I were married, if I'd only been lucky to find a partner, then I would have gotten four rounds of IVF. You know, Here I am, a 36-year-old single woman working in tech. I'm running out of my reproductive time. I'm afraid I'm going to be infertile and I don't get access to health insurance to cover my egg freezing cycles. So there was a lot of activism by women in tech to get those fertility benefits in there. But it hasn't carried over to all of America, you know? 
And I live in a state, Connecticut, which is one of the handful of states, there are about 15 American states that have a so-called insurance mandate. They're called the mandate states, which says that in Connecticut, if you were an employer with 60 or more employees, your health insurance coverage is mandated to cover infertility diagnosis and treatment. So you will get infertility and IVF covered in the mandate state of Connecticut. And so again, that's for married people who've got an infertility diagnosis. And so women were really upset. It's like, I am single. I didn't find a partner. I want to have a child. I need to use egg freezing. And it is not covered for me here in my mandate state. This is a form of discrimination against mm -hmm. single women. And so women in my study, that was one of their biggest recommendations. Like we've got to do something about the inaccessibility, the high cost, the problems of access, especially for minority populations, including LGBTQ populations and single women. We matter too, you know, single women and more and more single women who can't find partners are choosing the route of single motherhood. We need help with this process. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge issue for America, you know, just the lack of, of insurance coverage and the feeling among single women of just being put on the margins. Mm. Okay. And yet that sort of that very strong recommendation for greater access, greater funding for egg freezing um, has sort of a somewhat uneasy relationship with the feminist discourses or debates or critiques that egg freezing as a technology has faced. And you talk a little bit about that in the book also, the kind of the different feminisms that might um, respond to egg freezing in different ways. Right, I sort of, you know, there's been a lot of feminist discourse. There's been what we might call the egg freezing debates as I called them, and I think others have called them. But yeah, I mean, ever since the technology came off its experimental status, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of feminist discussion about whether this is a good technology for women or whether it really, you know, reinforces what you could call stratified reproduction, inequality, uh, intervention, harmful intervention into women's bodies. Normative and, motherhood. Uh, pardon? Normative yeah. motherhood. Normative motherhood, heterosexual families, um, you know, and this thing about the structure of the workplace, women being sort of forced or coerced to use technologies to sort of be better employees and to be able to get promoted and so on. And so, you know, these are all well and good. And I actually found that in my reading, there are sort of four different feminist discourses. I call, and there was only one that's really positive on egg freezing, um, which I called a sort of pro-liberal feminist discourse saying, wait, this can really help women in various ways. It can sort of equal the playing field because men don't have this reproductive time pressure and they end up, you know, reproducing in their 50s, 60s and 70s and so on, you know, and that's not fair, is it? And other that, you know, this is just another reproductive choice that some women can make if they want to. And so they put it sort of into the liberal sort of class of another technology that increases women's reproductive choice. But then there are three very critical discourses, um, one that I called structural feminism that comes from a sort of neo-Marxist uh, neo kind of framework of looking at the structure of labor, employment, childcare, all of the things in women's lives that really impinge upon them in terms of being able to be both good workers and good mothers, right? And that egg freezing has the potential to be used in a very negative way by employers to sort of encourage women to put off and postpone childbearing. And so that's been the major discourse, you know, mm -hmm. in the popular media. Oh, this is for selfish women or women who are victims of corporate neoliberal, you know, work, uh, workforce pressures that they can only be good mothers by putting off their childbearing and so forth. So that is another major area of feminist concern. And then there is what you could call intersectional feminist concern, intersectional feminists who really care about the intersections of race, class, gender, nation, age, sexual orientation, all of the different ways that women can be marginalized and multiply oppressed. And the real concern that this isn't going to be used fairly, that only mm -hmm. certain kinds of women are gonna have access to the technology. And I think that's the one that right now most concerns me, you know, that, yeah, I think this is true. And most concerns 
uh, many of your interviewees by the sounds of it as well. Yeah, it but. did. That was the thing that really bothered them. Like, you know, other women I know won't be able to access this based on who they are socioeconomically, in terms of where they come from. And so that is a legitimate, I think, very form, uh, important form of critique. And then there's just what I call the techno critical you know, feminism, which has always been there since the earliest days of IVF, just mm -hmm. feminists who have real concerns about technology, about, you know, the use of intrusive, invasive, expensive, potentially harmful iatrogenic technologies in women's bodies and women's lives. And there's a lot of that. There always has been with, you know, IVF and all of the other reproductive technologies. Mm -hmm. And I hear that too. I mean, this is not an easy technology. And I actually talked about the physical embodiment of it and sort of the difficulties of using it and just concerns, the potential for complications to happen. It's all in my book, but I think that has been overemphasized in the sort of feminist landscape that this is bad, bad, bad for women. And I just don't agree with that. You know, and I actually say at the end of the book, you know, had I been in the position that many of these women were in, um, you know, and I had a very rugged start to my own reproduction. It was very difficult, very painful. I might have used it, you know, a generation ago. I don't immediately just sort of say we can't use these technologies. And so I understand and empathize with women who find themselves in a situation where they feel that they need this technology. It's women who are basically being thwarted in their reproductive desires. These are all women who are doing this because they are holding out hope that they can become a mother. They've wanted to be mothers in the vast majority of cases. And it's the one thing that they feel they can do really when they're running out of time. Because mm. I do want to emphasize that all over the world, the studies that have been shown about women using egg freezing, they're the average age is the late 30s to early 40s. I mean, this is not a technology that women are jumping on in their early 20s. And I don't think we need to fear that. The fear that mm -hmm. women are going to be given egg freezing as a college graduation present and they're going to be doing this, you know, for no reason in their 20s. I wouldn't recommend women doing it in their 20s. And I don't think those are going to be the main users of the technology. I think this is a technology that is appropriate for certain women in their you know, early to sort of mid thirties when they feel that they still want to have a biogenetically related child, but they do not find themselves in the position to do so because they can't find the partner with whom they wanna do it. And women in this study were for the most part, very clear that they had thought about single motherhood and doing it alone. But when you're a woman living in New York City, Washington, DC, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, these are very expensive places to raise a child. And a lot of women were being very pragmatic saying, I just don't think I can do it by myself, on my salary, with daycare. You know, I'm being, I really wanna do this. I wanna parent with a partner. And I they had that it. emotional commitment that yeah. they, they, they sort of emotionally wanted a partner too, didn't they? For love, for love. Yeah to feel love and the enjoyment of companionship. So I have to just re-emphasize, it was the partnership problems. I called it the men mm -hmm. and partners problem, the missing men, the mating gap. That is the huge finding of a huge study and, a, and one that we need to talk about rectifying. And I'm gonna tell you at the end of the book, I looked at the educational disparities all around the world. And there we can find them all around the world now, including in the UK, including in most Western countries, including Australia, New Zealand, and France and Norway. Women are doing wonderfully educationally. They're matriculating into universities in high numbers and they're way outstripping men in their societies. Mm -hmm. And it's not, not only in the Western countries, it's found in, it's found in every region of the world now, except for Sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at the World Bank data, you see really, they call it the gender parity index and women are just uh, excelling educationally and beginning to really demographically outstrip men in terms of university education. And so somebody needs to do something about that, mm. but it's really causing a problem for educated women who want to find an equally educated partner. And that's really at the basis, it's the crux of this egg freezing issue. I mean, so in your, in your book, you focus on the U.S., but what you've just told us is that 
that this data around the world suggests that what you've identified as the mating gap of these educated women not being able to find equally educated men is something that's set to rise globally. And, you know, what's a line in your book that I found really powerful work towards the end, you say that um, egg freezing cannot solve the fundamental human problem at the heart of the um, egg freezing phenomenon, because it is about that mating up. So well, where, what do you think the, the future is here? Do you think there is a future of frozen fertility? Is egg freezing set to expand? Is it going to solve the kinds of issues that women have identified? Yeah, I think, first of all, that um, egg freezing already is expanding globally. You know, the most recent report, international report from the International Federation of Fertility Societies looked at where egg freezing is now available around the world. And it's just rapidly growing. I mean, many countries now are offering egg freezing, not only for these elective purposes for healthy women, but there's also a very important use of egg freezing for medical reasons, especially mm -hmm. young women facing cancer and, you know, other forms of fertility, um, you know, real fertility crisis, what I call fertility emergencies. So both medical and non-medical egg freezing are rapidly rising in many different countries around the world. And I do believe it's going to be, you know, we're going to see the rapid turn and expansion of egg freezing because of the very same problem that I've identified in America. It's mm -hmm. being, well, I'm, you know, the book is called Egg Freezing and the American Mating Gap, but we could call it a global mating gap because it's going global. I mean, really two thirds of countries, I think we're seeing this disparity with men, you know, uh, women outstripping men today in higher education. So yeah, that's one thing. I think the other big question is, you know, well, what to do about the men, right? I mean, we really need to address why men are falling behind educationally in many different societies. And it's an increasing concern here in the United States. You know, there's a report that was published by MIT called Wayward Sons, like what happened to young men? Um, you know, there are a lot of young men are very financially fragile. They don't have good jobs. They're not in a position to really, you know, partner and raise a family. So something needs to be done about that. That's a real socioeconomic sort of issue. But we have to sort of argue that for the near future, there simply are not going to be enough educated men to go around. And it's going to be worse in America over time. The Gen Z generation is going to uh, face an even wider mating gap with fewer educated men in their generation. And so I really argued um, in my book that you know, men and women are going to have to accept some anthropological terms called hypergamy and hypogamy. Hypergamy is marriage upward. You know, somebody older, more educated, more financially stable. Hypogamy is marriage downward to somebody who's younger, less educated, less professionally developed. And I've really argued that women are going to have to sort of get beyond this notion of pure equality in all aspects to sort of look for men who are less educated than they are. And this really could be working class men, men who don't have a full college education or you know, have a high school education. Those men can make very good partners. You know, They can be loving, committed to parenthood. They can be intelligent. I mean, all the things that you want, they just don't have the same level of education for maybe because they couldn't afford to go to school. Mm -hmm. Going to university is very expensive in America. It's another gap, right? So I talk about that, that women are gonna to have to sort of open up their eyes. And I myself, I tell my personal story in this book, as you know, and my husband hadn't finished college when I met him. He was going back to complete his college education, but I knew he was intelligent and kind and, and you know, could make a good partner. And he was very interested in having children. So, you know, and then he went on and he got his master's degree, but I'm, I did what would be called hypogamy. I married somebody who was significantly less, less educated than I. I had a PhD and an MPH, a master's degree. And, you know, he eventually got his master's degree. So um, women, you know, open your eyes a bit. That's sort of what I would say. Not all men who are less educated are, they could make very fine partners, I think. I want to say that. Um, and I, I you know, I think what else? I, I don't think that egg freezing is something that young women should do. I mean, there are companies that are really aggressively marketing to younger women saying, freeze now and you won't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. but I, mean, I, I think that is concerning, right? It's That's a real concern. Concerning. Yeah, and it, it's really not the population. I actually talk about the sort of fragile timing. When is the best time to freeze your eggs? You know, 
fertility begins to sort of slightly decline at about age 32. Okay, we see a slight decline in ovarian reserve, the sort of number and quality of women's eggs. And it sort of slightly declines there, but where we see the really steep decline is around age 37. And some people have called it the fertility cliff. There's a pretty dramatic decline at age 37. And so in that interim period between about age 32 and definitely before age 37, if you're going to freeze your eggs for all the reasons we've discussed, that is sort of what one of the physicians I interviewed called the sweet spot. It's probably sort of the best time to do it is in your early to mid thirties. Um, you know, and some women, unfortunately, just don't have good fertility, even in their mid thirties, they think they're being proactive, mm -hmm. and they find out that they have like premature ovarian aging. So we need women to start thinking about their fertility and to get some advice. I mean, this is something I talked a lot about in the book, just sort of knowing your fertility and having some fertility education, and being aware of fertility decline, age-related fertility decline. And at your annual well woman visit, talk to your gynecologist, talk to your GP, talk about fertility. If you have desires to have children and be pregnant and do it with your own eggs, you need to be talking to medical personnel, the people you trust about this. Because I found a lot of women really had no idea that their fertility was going to be in bad shape by the time mm -hmm. they got to egg freezing. And I, that's a really important issue too, I think. Yeah. We need to be you know, thinking more proactively and just have better knowledge about our reproductive bodies as women. I mean, I think your book is, um, it's a wonderful book. And I think it's going to not only help a lot of women, you know, far beyond academia, understand this phenomenon of egg freezing a lot better. But I think um, it's going to be the kind of book where a lot of women who are reading it are going to find themselves and they're going to find that they really identify with some of those really um, vibrant stories and characters you bring out. And I think that's going to be really, really important because, as you say, you know, a lot of women felt that they were outliers or they were alone. But this isn't, you know, this isn't something that's happening to a few women. It's about millions and millions of women and probably a growing number of women finding themselves in this position of being in their mid, late 30s, early 40s and not being at the stage of life, perhaps that they assumed they would be. So, Marsha, mm -hmm. thank you so much for thank giving you. us this time. And thank you so much for writing this uh, wonderful book that lots of people are going to have the opportunity to read before too long, I hope. And it's mm -hmm. been wonderful talking to you about it today. I couldn't have had a better interviewer than you, Zaina. <laughs> I have to say, Zaina, you did a remarkable thing for me because you were the one I turned the manuscript over to as I was writing it. And just every chapter, you gave me wonderful, sagacious, just incredibly useful advice. And I do just want to reiterate, I wrote the book in, I think, a pretty accessible style so that it won't just be for mm -hmm. academics, for courses and for scholars. I really hope that women themselves, their parents, family members, and men read this particular book. I hope that it I'm will sure be. I'm sure they will. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much. You for so today. much. It's been thank wonderful. you, Marsha. Thank you. Bye-bye.